Jason Schultz, and uh, uh, I'm a researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Centre. And I brought uh, Katie Rayworth here to Stockholm for an event that we ran yesterday for the Pontus Schultz Foundation. And then uh, I realised we also had the opportunity to, to bring you here uh, to the Stockholm Resilience Centre to give a Stockholm seminar. And I'm really happy that you can make it. Uh, Kate Rayworth uh, teaches at the Oxford Environmental Change Institute and she has developed a model that she will talk you through, uh, partly based on the planetary boundaries uh, that uh, Joel Rockstone and colleagues uh, presented in 2009. So a big hand to Kate. Welcome on stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucien. Um, if I speak like this, can everybody hear me? Yes. Cool. Okay, great. Right, I am so delighted to be here. Um, I want to start with an apology and a thank you. So the apology is for my cultural insensitivity, because I know that today is the 4th of October, and it's Kanyel Bullen's dog. <laughs> and I dare to turn up here and talk about donuts. So, sorry. <laughs> I was actually having, I went to a little cafe this morning, I was staying in someone's apartment, I bought a coffee and a croissant, I sat down and this man said to me, and I said, I don't speak any Swedish, and he said, you're eating a croissant and it's cinnamon bun day. <laughs> and then he explained, and then for, after this conversation, there's somewhere on, on Facebook, there's a little video of me going, Yogzilla Kanyel Bullen's dog. <laughs> so... Uh, I feel very uh, Swedish this morning. Um, but the, the thank you is much more important because uh, the book I've written, I don't have a copy of it here, but the, the book, is there, there we are, okay. Oh, the American one. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The American one, okay. Really naughty donut with sprinkles on that stuff. Out the back. Anyway, this book I've written absolutely would not exist and the ideas in it would not exist if it were not for the ideas that came out of this building and the people in this building. So I am profoundly grateful uh, not only for the ideas of the planetary boundaries that came from here, but also the generosity of people to allow some maverick like me to take on it and doodle on top of it and call it a donut. Uh, so thank you, a huge thank you to particularly uh, the first time I, I showed it to anybody connected this place, it was Sarah Cornell. Is Sarah here? She's not here at the moment. She was in the room and, and I was really nervous. I thought, what are they going to say? And she said, that's fantastic. And she encouraged me from the outset. And then the first time I met Johan, I was really scared. And he, he said, this is great and, and, and encouraged me. And then last time I was here a couple of years ago, I presented the ideas in progress. And afterwards, Gary emailed me with some really insightful comments and so generously commented on every chapter in my book. So I feel absolutely supported and encouraged um, and really uh, yes, deeply supported in the science and the ideas and the courage to go forward with it. So thank you so much. Uh, it feels like bringing the idea back home. I'm, I, this is, I did something naughty with your idea and I'm, <laughs> I'm bringing it back home. So let me just tell you the story of where that comes from. So I grew up as a teenager of the 1980s. I saw a famine in Ethiopia, a hole in the ozone layer, uh, Exxon Valdez spewing oil into Alaska. And I just knew one thing at the end of the 1980s, I wanted to make a difference, help change the world. Who doesn't? And I believe that the best way to do that was to go to university and study economics because it's the mother tongue of public policy. So if I knew that, I could make a difference. So off I trotted to university, but I found that the issues I cared most about, like environmental integrity, I'm told, that, oh, that, that's an externality. It's like, is, that, is it outside? Where, where is it? It didn't come into the syllabus. Social justice doesn't really come in. So the things I cared about the most were pushed to the margins. And so I walked away from academic economics, far too embarrassed ever to call myself an economist. Who would want to introduce themselves like that? And I went off, I worked three years in the villages of Zanzibar. I worked four years at the United Nations. I worked for a decade with Oxfam. Are any of my Oxfam colleagues here? No, they were gonna come, okay. Um, I worked for a decade with Oxfam and I became a mother. And all of these experiences about different aspects of the economy really began to make me realize one thing, which is you can't walk away from economics because it frames the world we live in. And when I came back from maternity leave, I had twins, so I you know, took a full year. I had nothing to do with the world of work. I came back, I didn't know what had been going on. And I said to one of my colleagues, what's been happening you know, while I've been away? 
And he said, oh, I made this PowerPoint of the big ideas that have been happening in the world. And I was flicking through and this picture. And literally, the minute I saw this picture, I had this bolt of adrenaline. What is this? I said to my colleague, what is this? He said, actually, I can't remember where it came from. <laughs> um, and I looked it up and I said, before I even knew what I was looking at, I knew I was looking at something that was bringing me back to economics because I felt, I felt what I'm seeing here is that the world scientists are saying, look, economists, if you can't recognize that the economy is a subset of the environment, we're going to do it for you. In fact, we've already done it. And we're not going to do it in your metrics of dollars. We're going to do it in our metrics of parts per million of carbon dioxide, of tons of uh, fertilizer use. And I, I thought this is a powerful rebalancing between the disciplines of natural scientists reining in the scope of economics. And I'm sitting in a social justice organization. There's people calling for education for all, building wells in India, responding to famine in Africa. I thought, what can, what can we as social justice add, build on this? And so I drew on this inside, and it turns into this donut. But the, the idea that's inspired me for so long is this idea from Buckminster Fuller, which is you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And I love that. Sometimes the best form of protest is to propose something new. It's harder than merely critiquing, but propose something new. That's what I saw when I saw the planetary boundaries diagram. And so I turned it into this donut. Let me tell you briefly, in the middle, in the hole in the middle is the place where people are falling short on life's essentials, where people don't have the food, healthcare, education, gender equality, political voice, so that they can lead a life of dignity and opportunity and community. So we want to get everybody in the world out of that space. And yet, we cannot afford to overshoot this outer crust, because there we put so much pressure on this extraordinary living planet that we begin to kick it out of kilter, causing climate breakdown, ocean acidification, air and chemical pollution. So we need to find a balance between the two. In the simplest words, can we meet the needs of all within the means of the planet? Just talking about meeting the needs of all, I can see some people way out in the corridor. Is there any way if you want to come in, just shuffle down. I feel bad that there's people. Do you want to come in a little bit more? Meet the needs of all <laughs> within the means of the room. Yeah. So, to me, this is a compass for the 21st century. It's our generational challenge. Can we find a way to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet? And I think this is what future generations will remember us for. But if it is a compass, then where are we? Where are the needles pointing? Well, right now, it's not a pretty picture. And it's on the back of your little flyer. Millions, indeed billions of people fall short on life's essentials. On food there, for example, the little red wedge goes 11% of the way towards the center of the circle because 11% of people in the world are undernourished. You could use more and more indicators. This is just illustrative of the basics. Water, 13% of people don't have access to clean water. One person in three has no access to what we would call a toilet. But this holds on all of these social dimensions and for people in countries rich and poor. So there's a lot of work to do there. And yet, we've already overshot at least four of these planetary boundaries on climate change, excessive fertilizer use, land conversion, and biodiversity loss. And we don't even know where we are on air and chemical pollution. So this is a compass for humanity at the start of the 21st century. And it's a hell of a challenge. We need to change so many things, the way we create businesses, the way we design cities. But for me, it took me back to my passion or my frustration of economics. And I believe that the economists of last century never saw this picture. They never saw this challenge. So why on earth would we think that their ideas were fit for our times? We have to rewrite the economic mindset. And I think continually of students starting university, right now, right, this week, starting university, what are they being taught when they study economics? I think they are going to be the policy makers and people here, the policy makers towards 2050, but the economic students are still being taught ideas from the textbooks of 1950. And those are based on theories from 1850. And given the challenges of the 21st century, from climate change to extreme inequality to financial crisis, this is shaping up to be a disaster. So we re need to rewrite those ideas. Pictures are powerful. I learned this when I first published this donut idea in 2012. And it's a, a story that's been known for centuries. Here, Copernicus, he knew that pictures are powerful because Ptolemy over here, who put Earth unmoving at the center of the known universe, 
Copernicus had watched the motion of the planets all his life and he knew that Ptolemy had it all wrong. But he waited until he was on his deathbed before he dared to publish his own alternative picture. Because he knew that by putting the sun, not Earth, at the center of the known universe, he was threatening papal power. He was challenging church authority and questioning man's place in the universe. So it's extraordinary what havoc a few concentric circles can unleash. <laughs> which is why we should think very carefully about the diagrams at the heart of economics. The diagrams that slip into the back of every student's head and tell us wordlessly the essential questions of economics that never actually need to be asked in question, but the ones that are so defining of how we think. Questions like, what is the economy? And what is it for? And how does it work? And who are we? And I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of the 20th century mindset that tells us the answer to these. And then replace them, because graffiti, these ideas are like graffiti on the mind, and it's almost impossible to scrub graffiti out. You have to paint over it with something new. You can't remove an old picture, you put a new one in its place. So I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour, and there could be no better guide than this man. This is Paul Samuelson. He was professor of economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the 1940s. And his textbooks are the mother of all economics textbooks still taught today. Now, Samuelson knew the power that he had in writing the textbook. He said, I don't care who writes a nation's laws or crafts its advanced treaties, so long as I can write its economics textbooks. <laughs> the best bit. The first lick is the privileged one, impinging on the beginner's tabula rasa at its most impressionable state. You see, Paul Samuelson thinks your mind is a blank slate and he's going to lick it. <laughs> and he has already licked it because he's licked all of our minds. You see, when Samuelson sat down in the 1940s to draw a picture of the economy, he was teaching engineering students. So he made it easy for them. He, ma he drew it looking like a radiator system. You have businesses and public, what we would call households, and you can see that water's being pumped in there and it flows around and around these pipes. Now, what he's showing is income flows around the economy just like water would flow around pipes. It's a clever metaphor if you're looking at the circular flow. Trouble is, this diagram has changed only a little bit in the last 70 years. Today, it looks like this. And every economic student learns it as the circular flow of income. So we've got the essential market relationship between households and business. Households provide their labor and their capital. In return, they get wages and share of profit. And they use that money for consumer spending to buy goods and services. And so the resources go round and round, and so does the money. And yes, not all money is used for consumer spending. Some of it is taken by banks and turned into investment. That's not actually true. That's not how banks work. But I'm not even going to go there today. Some of it is taken as taxes, and then they can, government can spend it. That's not even how government spending works. I'm not even going to touch that today. And some of it goes off for imports, but comes back from, for exports. Trouble with this diagram, of course, is that it only shows what's monetized. That's the only flows it tracks. But it's still the biggest picture of the macroeconomy that an economist can show you today. Oh, the blind spots and the blank spaces. It makes absolutely no mention of the living world, of all the materials and matter and energy drawn daily into the economy and spewed out as waste and pollution. It makes no mention of the unpaid caring work of parents, all the cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping that many of us have already done today and do every day to make that labor and the future labor fresh and ready for work each day. And it makes no mention of the commons, the place where people come together and organize, not with the market and not with the state, but as a community to create things they value without money changing hands. Well, if the picture that we have of the economy today at the start of the 21st century says nothing of the living world, says nothing of the unpaid caring work of parents, says nothing of the commons, then we're missing some of the most fundamental sources of our well-being, and those blank spaces will come back to bite us. What about who we are? That story goes back to Adam Smith, and Smith actually had a nuanced view of humanity. He said that self-interest is powerful for making markets work, but it's our interest in others that is essential for making society work. And he championed and celebrated our sense of public spirit, justice, generosity. He said, these are the traits most useful to others. But that was too nuanced when the economists wanted to create a model 
of humanity to put at the heart of economics. And so when people like John Stuart Mill came along, Mill just plucked out one trait. He said, political economy does not treat of the whole of man's nature, but sees him as a being who desires to possess wealth. And right there, he defined us as this creature who we now know as rational economic man. Well, he's never actually drawn in the textbook, so I decided to draw him. <laughs> He'd look like this. He'd be a man standing alone, money in his hand, ego in his heart, a calculator in his head, <laughs> nature at his feet. He hates work and he loves luxury and he knows the price of everything. And the trouble with this character is not how absurdly narrow he is, the real trouble with him is what looking at him does to us, is doing to you. Because, and this was the most fascinating thing I learned, the more that economic students learn about this character, rational economic man, as they go through their studies, the more they come to value self-interest and the less value they give to collaboration, altruism. So what began as a model of man we start to mirror him, we, it becomes a model for man. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become, which means there's an extraordinary responsibility on any academic discipline that claims to tell us who we are, because it changes who we become. But if we are going to be more than 10 billion human beings on this planet this century, and we continue to imagine and conduct and justify ourselves as rational economic man, we stand very little chance of thriving here together. What about how the economy works? Well, this story goes back to the 1870s when a small group of economists were desperate to make economics a science as reputable as physics. And so they looked to the great physics of the day, that of Isaac Newton. This is his diagram of gravity pulling a ball to rest. And so when William Stanley Jevons began drawing his economics diagrams, he drew them in the style of Newton. It looks like physics, it smells like physics, it must be <laughs> physics. And he said, just as gravity pulls an object to rest, so markets and prices, prices pull markets into equilibrium. He talked of the market mechanism and market forces. You can hear the Newtonian physics in the language. This diagram is part of the first diagram that every economic student learns today, supply and demand. The analogy is still there at the heart of what we get taught. But the real problem with this metaphor, this desire to be like physics, is actually that it set economists off searching, just as Newton had found the physical laws of motion, they began to search for the economic laws of motion. And when data became, became available, then they started number crunching and, and looking for the hidden patterns so they could find the laws and have them named after them. And two of these apparent laws have been extraordinarily influential in our politics for decades, and they look very similar to each other. Now, the first one is called the Kuznets Curve, discovered by Simon Kuznets in the 1950s. He said, I think I see a pattern, UK, Germany, and the US over time, as the economy gets richer overall, inequality first increases, but then it decreases. He even said, I wouldn't expect this to happen. I'd expect the rich to get richer, not the poor to catch up but he tried to explain and understand what he'd seen. He said it might even be a figment of these, this particular period in history. It would be terrible if it became an unwarranted dogmatic generalization. He said that. That's exactly what happened because this image becomes a mantra and it whispers silently to us, if you care about inequality, no need for redistribution, you socialist. Just make sure the economy grows because growth will eventually even things up. And then the second one in the 1990s, the environmental Kuznets curve. A little bit of data on local air and water pollution, it seems to show the same, that as economies get richer, first pollution gets worse, but then it gets better. Like a well-trained child, the economy will clean up after itself. If you care about the environment, don't try and regulate. No, 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 no. Growth, growth will grow now and clean up later. Look, there's a law of motion. Of course, both of these turn out to be false. They don't exist, but the mantra and the image are so powerful that it justifies trickle-down economics, austerity economics, and grow now, clean up later policies. And they have shaped the policy landscape for decades. So the fake physics turned out to be fake, but it was a jolly good excuse in between for pursuing growth. And here Simon Kuznets comes in again. He was brilliant. He knew the caveats of everything he created. They just got ignored. In the 1930s, US Congress asked him to come up with a single measure of the US economy. And he did, it's what we now call GDP. 
And when he created, he said, this could scarcely be used to measure the welfare of a nation. It ignores the unpaid caring work of parents. It ignores the value of the community. And it's just a flow. So what's happening to the stocks underneath? But his caveats got pushed aside because the temptation of that single number to measure a country's progress year on year, and then when you could compare the US to the USSR and Europe, then you've got a horse race. And so we've been living for decades with economies that have come to expect, depend, and demand endless growth. In, the 19, in 1960, this man, W. Rostow, wrote a book. I love it so much, I got myself a first edition. It's called The Stages of Economic Growth, a Non-Communist Manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> and he said there are five stages of growth. First, you have the traditional society where nothing really is happening. Then you have the preconditions for takeoff when, when uh, you get the beginnings of a banking industry and um, uh, mechanization and education for work. And the people must be touched with the belief that growth is good for something beyond itself, like a better life for the children. Then you get takeoff, where growth becomes the normal condition, and the march of compound interest begins to bear its blessings. Then you get the drive to maturity, when you can have any industry you want, no matter what your resource base. And finally, lastly, the era of high mass consumption, where you can buy all the consumer goods you want. Well, you can hear the implicit metaphor, the aeroplane. But this aeroplane ride is unlike any other, because it can never be allowed to land. Rostow left us flying into the sunset of mass consumerism. And he knew it, as he said in his own book. And then the question beyond, where history offers us only fragments. What to do when the increase in real income itself loses its charm? But he never answered the question. And the reason is because it was 1960, he was going to be an advisor to the presidential candidate, John F. Kennedy. And Kennedy was running for election on the promise of a 5% growth rate. So Rostow's job was to keep that plane flying, not to ask if and how it could ever be allowed to land. So I've shown you the caveats. And when you hear the caveats and the blank spaces and the uncertainties around these diagrams, they look flimsy. But it's on those very uncertainties and blank spaces that powerful stories can be built. And that's what happened in the 1940s. A little band of economists met in a little Swiss village called Mont Pelerin. This is Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman. They said, we're going to write a new story of the economy and we're going to call it neoliberalism. They began because they saw the rise of the totalitarian state in the USSR. They wanted to push back against state power, but it quickly morphed into a push for market fundamentalism, the idea that everything could best and first be sorted by markets. And their ideas never got put into practice immediately. This was the 1940s, but they seeded think tanks, university posts, they worked with the chambers of commerce. They built up the narrative so that when Reagan and Thatcher came to power in the 1980s, they were ready. And Reagan and Thatcher were surrounded by members of the Mont Pelerin Society. And we've been living by that narrative ever since. So it's the neoliberal story of economics that stars the market because it's efficient, so give it free reign. It stars finance, which is infallible, so trust in its ways. It stars trade, which is win-win, so open your borders. And every great story has a villain. So it stars the state, which is incompetent, so don't let it meddle. <laughs> Other actors not needed on stage, but we can meet them anyway. Well, it stars the household, but that's domestic. You can leave that to the women. The commons, you all know the commons are tragic. We better sell them off. Society, as Thatcher said, there's no such thing as society, so we can ignore that. Our earth. Earth is inexhaustible. Take all you want. And as for power, well, we don't need to talk about power in economics. This is a positive, rational, objective science. So don't mention it. I believe this is the story that has been taking us to the brink of collapse. No wonder we live in a world in which so many people's most essential needs are unmet, and yet we've already overshot the bounds of our planet. How do we turn this around? We need new economic thinking for our times. So. Of course, you can guess, I think it comes with new pictures. I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of what I think is the new story we need to tell. So first, let's start where my economics degree never even went. We never asked the question, what is the economy for? What is its purpose? I think the purpose of the economy is obvious. It is to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. In my silly speak, to get into the donut. To live between social and planetary boundaries. So what mindset will give us the best chance of getting there? If I could show the first diagram 
to print on the new economic student's mind. I would never show them supply and demand. That says the economy is the market and the market's in equilibrium. That's two lies in one sentence. <laughs> I wouldn't even show them Samuelson's radiator. I would show them this picture. I call it the embedded economy and anyone who knows it, any economics will see it's drawing together ecological and feminist and commons theory. So you have the economy, which is embedded in society and all its social and cultural institutions, embedded within Earth. And it's drawing in living matter and materials and spewing out waste. And immediately we can ask the first question of ecological economics, which is how big can that through flow of materials and energy be before we begin to kick the Earth out of kilter? And it's bathed in a river of solar energy, so how can we be ingenious to capture that to meet our needs? But also the economy itself is divided into four forms of provisioning. Not just the market and the state, that was the 20th century ideological boxing match. You know, are you for a free market, laissez-faire capitalism, or are you a state-loving socialist? And that argument squashed out space for seeing the other two sectors, the household, where we all begin every day with unpaid caring work for our children, our partners, our parents, our neighbours, but also the commons where we collaborate to make things happen without money, but with community getting together. And of course, it was Ellen Ostrom's work that put this back on The Economist's map. And then there's finance, which is, should be in service to this provisioning, in service to life. What would it look like to have a financial sector that actually served this provisioning and served life? What about who we are? We're not rational economic man. We're so much more interesting than that. Yes, we can be competitive and self-interested, but we're also socially reciprocating and collaborative. Like these acrobats, we can do things together that we could never do alone. We have to move from the me to the we. We're embedded in the earth, this woman sowing seeds, our connection with the earth. But also we're not in independent and isolated, we're deeply interdependent. We're not dominant over nature, but embedded within the web of life. And we're not work-hating, we're purpose-seeking. And those are the lucky ones for whom those come together. This picture of humanity is of course being rewritten by, by behavioural economists, neuroscientists, psychologists, political scientists, and even economists. And it couldn't be more written more quickly because it's the most important portrait that's going to be painted in the 21st century. Who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we become. We need this new, richer picture if we're going to thrive together. What about how it works? Forget that Newtonian physics and gravity. And if you never got the joke about why did the chicken cross the road, the real punchline is that he wanted to teach you systems thinking. <laughs> so here's, I, I, I'm, I, this is like bringing, like we say in England, bringing coals to Newcastle, bringing something that's so familiar to somebody. But I just, the elements of systems thinking, I say is the two loops You've got the reinforcing feedback loop and the, the essence is the more you have, the more you get. So the more chickens you have, the more eggs you get, and the more eggs you have, the more chickens you get. Anything in the world that spirals up or spirals down is dominated by reinforcing feedback. And then you have the balancing feedback loop. The more chickens you have, the more road crossings they attempt, and the more road crossings, <laughs> the fewer come back. And that, so, you know, I'm, I get excited when I talk about economics and I start to sweat. So my body gets hot and it tries to cool me down. And our bodies are brilliant at this balance. But most of the interesting patterns in the world, from your family dynamics and your family relationships to the boom and bust of stock markets, to the rise of the 1%, to the collapse of ecosystems, are best understood through thinking in systems, which is why after the financial crisis of 2008, economists turned to the long neglected economist Hyman Minsky. Nobody had even heard of him. He'd been left behind in the 1970s. He had a theory called the financial instability hypothesis, which brilliantly explained what had happened. When you read Minsky's work, it's all about reinforcing and balancing feedbacks. He used systems thinking to explain what's going on in the world today. So if systems thinking is useful, it means it's time for a metaphorical career change for economists. Don't be a Charlie Chaplin trying to pull on the levers of the economy because it's not a machine and they ain't there. Be more like Josephine Baker here, watering her garden. And I like to think of an economy as a complex, evolving system, ever adapting. And as an economist, therefore, your role is to tend and steward and intervene at the places where you can shape it towards the design we want. We design gardens we don't control the plants, but we design gardens. So the question is, don't look for the laws of motion. Search for the principles of design. And what are those principles of design? I believe there are two that will guide us best. And this, to me, is the secret. If we're going to get into the donut, don't aim for the boundaries. Don't merely try to just pull back 
and push out from the middle. It won't get us there. We need to put we need to jump into imaginative design with two big principles, to be distributive by design and regenerative by design. And I'll say briefly what I mean by both. So an economy that's distributive by design is one in which value generated is shared far more equitably with everyone who helped to create it. The 20th century focused redistribution, if it ever dared to do it, on redistributing incomes from rich to poor. But I think we have to go deeper and look at the sources of the ownership of wealth and pre-distribute the sources of wealth generation. Of course, it's already happening. You can redistribute the ownership of housing. Here's some housing in Germany that was designed and built by, the, by its own inhabitants. Redistribute the ownership of energy systems thanks to renewable energy technologies. Here's an employee-owned company where the value created by the company goes to the employees, not some distant shareholders who never even turned up at the premises. And the distributive ideas of ideas. This is a maker space where people create things using open source design and they contribute their own ideas into the open source economy using Creative Commons licensing. This exists already. The distributive economy is emerging already. How can economists help it emerge faster? And then regenerative design. Through the middle of this diagram is the 20th century linear degenerative economy. We, we take Earth's materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while and throw it away. And that's what cuts against the cycles of the living world and pushes us over planetary boundaries. So we have to bend the arrows around and create a circular or cradle to cradle economy. Let nature regenerate herself. She's been doing that for 3.8 billion years. We must get out of the way. But even the materials that we create from this table and the laptop to the glass to regenerate, restore those. Again, it's happening already. Uh, his Sanergy is a, a company set up by some MIT graduates in the slums of Kenya where there were no toilets. They created toilets, they collect the human waste and turn it into organic fertilizer. It goes back on the field, closing that nitrogen and phosphorus loop. The open source vehicle, if you buy one, it comes in a kind of IKEA flat pack box. It comes like this. If you know what you're doing, you can assemble it in one hour. It's modular by design, 100% electric, and then you can build and customize it. And there's a global R&D team of people worldwide using this, so you become part of a global network of manufacture and design. And Houdini, I bet lots of you have some Houdini clothing. I spent yesterday with Eva Carlson, the head of Houdini, one of the most inspiring entrepreneurs I've ever met. 60% uh, of their clothing is already in the circular economy, they only use recycled polyesters and nylons, and they use wool and tensile. They are passionate about making products that are in the circular economy. All of these, by the way, are distributive too, by design. So it's already happening. Economists have an incredibly exciting opportunity. How do we create the business structures, the financing, to enable this stuff to come through? It's a design challenge. So back to this question of growth, because you see, Rostow left us flying into the sunset of consumerism. We live in economies, as he described, that have been structured to depend upon unending growth. They're financially, politically, and socially addicted. Financially, because at the heart of the today's financial system is the design of money and finance, which always pursues the highest possible rate of return. Politically addicted, well, no, no G20 leader wants to lose their place in the G20 family photo. But if your country stops growing, you'll get budged out. So we have a massive collective action problem here. Socially addicted, because thanks to a century of consumerist propaganda, we've been told that the best form of therapy is retail therapy, to transform yourself by something more. None of these addictions are insurmountable, but we need to overcome them. We need to get off the airplane ride. We need to flip away from thinking of unending growth. Nothing in nature does that. We need to mimic nature and allow economies that grow and then mature, that allow us to thrive whether or not they're growing. And think of this, put the design principles at the heart. Economies have the market, the state, the household and the commons. Only the market and the state show up in GDP. So it's only a partial snapshot of all the goods and services and value created and exchanged. We need them to be distributive by design, far more equitable nationally and globally. We need them to be regenerative by design if we're not going to crash over planetary boundaries. So we need to get off that airplane ride. And I like to replace one metaphor with another. So instead of thinking airplane that can never land, we all need to learn kite surfing. <laughs> now, has anyone in the room ever done kite surfing? OK, you're immediately going to know that I haven't. But here's my impression, right? So kite surfer has a board. 
and you're going along on your board, let's say the board is working with the regenerative waves of the economy, so you're moving towards regenerative design, but you also have the sail, which is catching the winds of distributive design. So you're working with the regenerative and distributive design. And kite servers have a bar in the middle, which you pull up and down to, to balance between the winds and the waves. Right, huh? Yeah? <laughs> right. And you're pulling it up and down, and that bar is moving in response to what's needed to work with the wind and the waves, with the regenerative and distributive. To me, that's a really great metaphor for what GDP needs to al be allowed to become a response variable that might go up and might go down in response to a far greater calling, an economy that's regenerative and distributive by design. One little example, China is investing $360 billion by 2020 in solar energy capacity installation. So that's a great big uplift for GDP. But once it's in, the, the economic value that'll go through GDP of generating electricity falls to near zero marginal cost. So it's not contributing to GDP. So you get this uplift and then nothing as a result of becoming regenerative and distributive by design. How can we transform our current system so that GDP stops being this essential target and becomes a responsive variable? To me, that is one of the most profound, challenging and exciting questions for the 21st century economist. So I leave you with a new story, a story of the 21st century economy, which of course stars Earth because she is life-giving, so we must respect her boundaries. It starts society, people, because it's foundational, so we must nurture our connections. It starts the market, no it doesn't, it starts the household, which is core. We begin there every day, so how do we value its contribution? The market is incredibly powerful, so how do we embed it wisely? The commons are extraordinarily creative. How can we unleash their potential, especially with the rise of the digital commons? And the state, of course, is essential. So how do we make it accountable? As for finance, it should be in service. What would it mean to have a finance sector that actually serves society? Business is fantastically innovative. How do we give it far more purpose than just maximizing profits? Trade is double-edged, so how do we make it fair? And power, it's everywhere. It's pervasive. We have to talk about it and check its abuse. I believe this is the beginnings of a new narrative of 21st century economics, and of course, it comes with pictures. And if you agree with me about the power of pictures, then you might like these. I've had the privilege of working with some of the world's best stop motion animators. And for each of the seven ways of thinking in my book, we made a one minute animation telling its story. As you can see, they're silly, they're funny, they're playful. Because I think it's time to take economics out of the ivory tower, out of the equations, bring it back out of our heads, into our bodies, our hearts, our bellies, make us laugh. We have to reanimate economics for the 21st century. I will stop there and I really look forward to discussion, critiques, suggestions. How do we make this actually happen? Thank you very much. Thank you.